Sunday night, 9 o'clock. Welcome to All Across Live. We have another great show for you tonight. We have a couple of uh, couple of guests with us uh, <clears throat> coming up in about 5-10 minutes uh, to deal with uh, the restoration of a lacrosse stick and getting it to its original owners, which uh, really is a great story. And uh, I look forward to having Brett Coy, Brent Coy coming on and uh, telling us about it. And uh, in the meantime, I have uh, Muffler Mike over in Connecticut. How are you, Muff? I'm doing good, Gary. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, Sean is on sabbatical this week. He's celebrating his 10th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, Sean. Excellent. Well deserved. Absolutely. And then, of course, we have a few other things in there. NLL signings, a couple of other bits and pieces of NLL news. And we also have uh, the Laxney tournament just uh, wrapped up just uh, hours ago. So we have all results of that for you. But before we get rolling, let's do all the network stuff for you. And that, of course, is episodes are streamed live across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and also Twitch. And you can catch all of our action on EOPsports.com. Remember to hit the subscribe, follow, and like buttons and always share. As you can see, we have many shows for many things. Um, enjoy all of our affiliates, which are the Broad Street Bully Podcast, Philly Press Box Radio, Edge of Philly Sports Live, Birds IQ, Madison Avenue Fanatics, Talking Philly Sports with Matty B, Devereaux Sports, The Painted Lions, Party on Broad, and of course my favorite, Steel Steps on Friday night, just after SmackDown. If you've missed a show, no worries. You can grab all the podcasts on all major podcasting companies, which include Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and Spotify. And also you can catch it on the EOP YouTube page, or if you're looking for our show, our library in particular, you can go to All Across All the Time on YouTube. Remember, you can stay up to date with all Philly sports by visiting eopsports.com with great articles from our huge staff and contributors. While you're there, please subscribe to our newsletter. And just before we get rolling, Mike, it's a reminder, everybody, that the first part of our show is brought to you by Dolan's. All right, guys, when you're staying local and you want to watch a great game or just hang out with some great people, make sure to go to Dolan's Bar at 24 East Sellers Avenue at Ridley Park. Right off of I-95, south of Philadelphia Airport, Dolan's Bar is the place to be. Great music, great times, memorabilia giveaways, great drinks, and even better food. You never know when a former Philly sports icon walks through the door. You've got to go to Dolan's 24 East Sellers Ave at Ridley Park. Tell PJ that EOP sent you. Go to dolansbar.com or follow them on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or even TikTok. We'll see you there for the game. And just a reminder to everybody that you can support us by sending stars. Stars help earn more money to make more content. So if you have an opportunity, please do it. And while we're on the topic of support, there is our field reporter, Eduardo, reporting from Jacksonville this week. All right. Hey, Eduardo. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, and don't forget about that Attacking Third podcast either. Uh, I believe the union are in the MLS playoffs. So, And uh, I think uh, uh, they're getting close to 30 years in the league now, and I think there have been five or six instances where a team that's lost in the final has gone back to the final the following year. Mm -hmm. So so it's not, uh, not out of the realm of possibility for the Absolutely. union to get back to the final and, and try to win a cup this year. They, uh, they fell just a bit short last year. So, yeah. Well, as, uh, as you see, Mike, I'm wearing the old orange uh, sweater still. And of course that is for truth and reconciliation uh, day. That was yesterday. Uh, though uh, kids were wearing it Friday for school because of course they weren't in school on Saturday. I uh, believe that every day should be truth and reconciliation day. Cause there's a lot of things to fix. Um, one Absolutely. day does not do it justice by any stretch of the imagination. No, and, uh, you know, you know, the more, the more I see it, the more I see that it's a, a lot of lip service. We need actual action. Um, let's move this thing forward. You know, yeah, not much more can be said about that really. You know, I, uh, especially in the U S so, well, you know, Canada, we're not, we're not exactly leading the charge with, uh, with many things. We're, uh, Still finding uh, finding 
people married, which shouldn't uh, shouldn't have ever been happening. Um, I, I so far as uh, I've been on record to say, I wish we would stop calling them schools because uh, my school never had a graveyard, uh, a track, portables, never never a graveyard. So maybe a residential concentration camp would be a better better word for it, but that would be uh, you know a little bit too forthwith, I guess. But let's move on to some great news instead. I've got a couple of guests I'm going to bring in. First off, I want to bring in uh, a friend of mine, Brent Coy. Can you hear me? I can. How are you, Brent? How are you doing? I'm great. Hey, Brent. Great Sorry, to have you. I, uh, oh. I'm catching you from the stairwell of my uh, hotel, so I apologize. <laughs> well, we've had it from everywhere now. We have a stairwell too, Mike. Can you put that on the list? Stairwell. <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> as long as you can hear us well and we can hear you just fine. So, okay. I also want to bring in uh, Jeff Doria. Jeff, how are you? Good. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Great. So, let's hey, Brett. Start. How you doing, bud? Good. Good. Nice to see you. Me too. So, let's let's talk about this a little bit. Um, Brett, you, uh, you were out in an, an antiquing. And you found a uh, an antique lacrosse stick. I have a couple of pictures of the one that you found, mm -hmm. and I actually have the actual uh, pictures of the finished product too. We'll show after, but let's just have a, have a gander at uh, at some of these these pictures of the stick. The markings. Mm -hmm. It's pretty tattered. It it was in rough shape when I found it. Yeah. Yeah. There's not, there's not a lot that can be. Uh, done with a stick in this in this form but um tell us a little bit about it let's talk about uh, how you how you came uh, across it first okay so um you know i was in a pretty popular well-known area here in new york called lake george and uh there's a, a community on lake george called bolton landing and bolton landing has a lot of little antique stops and sort of uh rustic things and i was there in january and i stopped at any antique store and he had a barrel of lacrosse sticks out in front of the store. And I don't know if uh, other guys have had this experience, but very often when you see those at antique stores and flea markets, what they think are old fashioned sticks tend to be a lot of girl sticks from, you know, the eighties, the, the wooden ones, but they're not really traditional lacrosse sticks, but they got them marked that way in like a bin. And that's, a lot of what he had and then i my eye was caught by two sticks there was a youth stick from uh cornwall island that, that had the sticker on the side you know that red sticker that i'm sure everybody's familiar with and then this one was next to it and i picked it up and my first thought was uh, wow it's pretty beat up but then i looked on the side and there was writing on it and it said RPI on it. Now I'm a, a local Albany, New York guy. So RPI is Rensselaer Polytech Institute. It's a, it's a program here that's pretty well known for hockey. But at one point in time, they were quite a, a good lacrosse team. As a matter of fact, before they had the NCAA tournament, RPI won the, the national title in the early 50s. So they, they got a pretty long uh, history of lacrosse. And as I, as I looked up on the, the stick, there was a name on it and 1961 was stenciled in there it was like black sharpie marker so i immediately was like oh this this stick belonged to somebody you know somebody played in the early 60s it had had to be um or it was their number <laughs> but the stick was old enough that it, it looked like it was a you know an upstate new york style stick from at least the 50s or 60s so you know i asked the guy at the counter you know, if he would make me a deal and he didn't really know anything about either stick. So he was like, ah, if you buy both of them, I'll give them to you for, and it was something ridiculous. I paid like 110 bucks for both of them or something. And I'm, and I'm sitting there trying to get out of the store as fast as I can before he realizes that he was making a mistake. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I immediately got out and I snapped a bunch of pictures. And one of my really, really good friends is a gentleman named Ron Patterson. And uh, Ron is a member of the Oneida Nation out in central New York, and he makes uh, sticks. So I snapped it, several pictures and sent them to him. And I was like, can you can you restore these? Because the, the Cornwall Island stick was warped at the bottom. It was it was uh, not straight. Right. 
and I sent him some pictures and he's like, yeah, I, I can probably do something with those, you know, and, you know, he's just like, get them to me whenever you can. Um, and because the name was on the stick, I, my immediate thought process was, I, oh, cool. I got this cool old stick. But then I was starting to think, all right, there's some history here. Wouldn't it be neat if I found out, you know, who owned it? So, you know, I, I, the name was missing the D in the front of it, right? And mm -hmm. it was faint and it was, you know, I was like looking online and I couldn't find anything. So I went to that forum on Facebook, that traditional wood stick group. Yep. And I hit up the group and I said, hey, look what I found. And somebody came back and said, there was a guy named John Diaria on the 1961 team for RPI. I'm finding the roster. And then that led me to try to do my own internet research. And I tracked down, you know, that he was a professor at, um, I think it was called Simon Frazier. And I found a LinkedIn profile that said, you know, RPI class of 61. I'm like, all right, well, it, I can't imagine there's two John Diorias from 61, you know? So I, I kind of was like, all right, I got the right, I got the right guy. And. All right. Just I, before we it, go any further, Brent, yeah. just a second. Jeff, can you give us a little bit of background on your dad? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I don't know much about his lacrosse playing, but um, but uh, so my dad grew up, you know, in, a, in kind of poor circumstances in uh, in New York City, um, and so he, uh, but he was a sort of a natural athlete. Uh, played stickball in the streets, and uh, you know, softball in Central Park, and um, yeah, it was it was really like an athlete. He used to joke that. Uh, um, that, he grew up in um, in Hell's Kitchen, uh, the Hell's Kitchen area uh -huh. of New York, and he used to joke that the reason why he, he got so fast was because he had to run away from all the gangs. <laughs> um, so, so he uh, he got a scholarship to RPI. Um, I, I think it was an academic scholarship. Um, and while he was there, he'd never played lacrosse before, and he he said he de he decided to just uh, try out for the lacrosse team, and he said he wasn't very good. Um, but he was fast and they liked that he was fast. And I, I, I assume that, you know, with, uh, the playing stickball and whatnot, he had really good hand-eye coordination. Um, mm -hmm. so that probably served him, him well, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what I know of him kind of like going, uh, to RPI and, and trying out for lacrosse. So Brent gets a hold of, of you. What is your initial reaction to they found stick that belonged to your dad? Uh, yeah. So initially I, it was, uh, so the, especially the way that it came at me, it was kind of like uh, it was a message from a guy in, in Mission, which is a town near Vancouver where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he said, hey, this guy's looking for you. He's got your dad's lacrosse stick. And I was just like, well, you know, my, you know, my dad passed away five years ago. What, what's going on? Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, so I, I uh, emailed him or I texted him back or I messaged him back on Facebook and uh and you know, I was like, "All right, I'll I'll, I'll bite. Sure, what, what, <laughs> let's let's find out what this is." And then uh, and then I had a nice conversation with Brent. We got hooked up eventually, and uh, and Brent told me a, a lot of the the history about the around the stick, and uh, and you know, it, it was just like really kind of uh, um, really kind of delightful, right? Like we, my dad was a big you know presence in our family. He's been gone for five years now, so it was just really um, great to to uh, get it get something or hear something about his past that uh, we didn't know anything about or right. not a lot about and a memento on top of that to go with it too. So that, that really is a yeah. beautiful thing. All right, Brent, let's talk about the restoration process. Cause obviously this yeah. took quite a bit of work. It, yeah, it did. And, and, you know, I kind of had a caveat about the restoration with Ron, where I didn't want all the patina stripped off the stick because it had, you know, RPI in it and it had his name and everything. But right. if, if you look at the stick, in order for Ron to fix it as the head of the stick, you know, curves up, he, he had to do a lot of sanding and, and polyurethaning and get it back in, in place. So you, you'd have to have the stick right there, but if you look closely, you can still see that the, the outline of, of part of the name is still on the stick. Um, so well, he, let's you know, he yeah. 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 Well, let's he he didn't get rid of the entire, um, you know, presence of the name, but, you know, the shaft is almost exactly the way it was. I wanted him to leave, you know, at least some of that patina on there. So you knew, yeah, so you knew that there was the stick, but, you know, he did an out. I mean, Ron's an artist, you know what I mean? And, and, and 
I think a lot of people now, since Alfie died, have sort of, sort of come on board um, with wooden sticks. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think people understand what goes into these things, right? And not only what goes, it's leather all leather. Yeah. You look at this, and yeah. the finished product is this. And uh, to me, that's astounding. That's incredible. Yeah. Just and, and I will refer anybody to Ron. I mean, you know, the, the, when you get those wooden sticks and he has to go back in and re-steam them and straighten them and, and, and do all that, um, you know, that's enough of a job. And then I was like, well, listen, I want this to be the way it was in the 50s. So it's got a real gut wall in it. It's got the one, um, you know, the one shooter across the top that's gut. And it's like, it doesn't look like the same stick, which is part of the reason I wanted them to leave some of that, you know, patina on there so that you could tell it was, mm -hmm. it was the one I found in that barrel. Um, That's astoundingly and, great work though. My oh God. yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I just uh, clarify, Brent, did, are you saying that they actually had to straighten the stick and then re-bend um, it again? Well, not straighten it, but if you, if you look at the pictures of the original stick, it didn't quite have that, uniform shape on it it was kind of coming mm. at the top there it was kind of coming back i think he i think he steamed it just a little bit to get that that bend back in it but he sanded it and he redid everything and he put the leathers in and um you know like i said he he left a lot of that original patina but he makes them from you know from uh from scratch so he obviously knows how to restore them and I was blown away when he when he sent it back to me because, um, you know, at that point I'd already decided I was going to try to find the family or maybe the relatives of the family and try to get the stick to them. But, y you know, you have that when you when you're getting it back, you're almost like, OK, what's it going to look like? And, and you have that anticipation in your head that it's going to look like it just came out of the store. And sometimes you'll get it back and they'll be like, well, that's the best I could do. You know, it's it was all when I got it back, I was kind of like, holy cow, man, if it didn't have the original patina on there, I wouldn't know it was the same stick. Yeah. Um, because Absolutely. he just, he just did a phenomenal job on it. Um, you just look at the, the bend of the stick and it yeah. is in slivers, the, the original picture. And you look there at what Jeff's got in his hand and it's incredible. You know, it's, yeah. it is new. It looks just as though it just came right out of his shop. First, yeah, and I mean, you, you know, there was some there was some um, deficiencies in the wood from the age, and there were some splits and things where, mm -hmm. I mean, you could you could probably go out with that and have a gentle throw with it. I wouldn't advise you know doing anything beyond that. But when I got it out of the bin, you you couldn't have even done that if if the if the pocket was still somewhat intact. It was you know it was gonna fall apart. You know, so he did an out. I, like I said, I refer him out whenever people are on that forum and they say, Hey, who can fix a stick? I'm like Ron Patterson on night nation, you know, cause he's just, he's, I, I, I don't want to use this term like overuse it, but I really don't think people appreciate what master craftsmen slash artists, the guys who make these uh, mm -hmm. actually are. Um, can I, can I ask you a question about that, Brent? Sure. What, one of the things that I loved hearing about when, when we, we spoke before was the origins of the actual stick. Um, can you tell me more about that? Well, that particular stick that was your dad's, just from the style, I, I believe it was probably manufactured somewhere in upstate New York or maybe Cornwall because that's where a lot of them came from. Being that he was a New York guy, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if it was Alfie's dad that made it. Um, in the Syracuse area, but you know, they have to go out and harvest the hickory tree. Uh, sometimes they're made out of ash, but most of those are hickory and they have to go, you know, find the tree, find the right dimension. They got to, they got to split it the right way. Then they got to bend it, let it cure, come back and back bend it, sand it, drill it, you know, and then, then put the gut wall in, which a lot of guys will do some sort of synthetic gut, but you know, Ron makes it from scratch and find the leathers. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a year, year and a half process before you're even going to have a, a stick like that. If the guy decides he wants to do one today. Um, and you know, that particular stick, when I saw it, there's just, 
and, and, and Gary can probably speak to this too, you know, depending on where you are and where certain sticks are made, you, you just kind of, after a while, get an eye for, okay, I got a rough idea where that sticks from. That yep. looks like, you know, that's a Cornwall Island stick. That looks like that's a Tuscarora Patterson stick. That looks like that's a, well, definitely Alfie. I have two of Alfies and they're very, um, yeah, they're very, very, uh, they're very unique. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when I saw that, I was like, ah, that's an upstate New York stick probably, you know, and then I saw RPI on it and I was like, wow, I got to grab this, you know. So the stick finally that's arrived, it. Jeff, um, the reaction. Now you have this in your hands. You'd heard about it. You saw pictures, obviously, of what it was like or probably as it was coming along, but you actually held the stick. What was the reaction? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, as as you guys are, are noting, I mean, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, like it's almost sculptural, right? And uh, and to know that, that my dad was uh, using this in the early 60s when, uh, you know, he was like at university, it was just, uh, I don't know, it's just it's just really nice, you know? Um, uh, and just, uh, just like, just have felt a ton of appreciation to, to Brent, um, for, uh, for the thoughtfulness of, uh, you know, finding a, a beautiful object and, um, tracking it, the origin. It reminds me a little bit of the, I don't know if you remember the movie, the red violin, yes, I um, do. as things kind of like artifacts go through time and beautiful artifacts go through time. Um, and the, as you, as you're mentioning the patina and, and everything, it's just, I don't know. It just gives me a little bit of chills. <laughs> I love the idea just just because, you know, if we're lucky, we're remembered for three generations, if we're lucky. To have a piece like that can go five, six generations mm -hmm. by have, even having it explained. And just the explanation of, of dad playing in university and all the other things that went on, uh, it's, it's heartwarming, really. And in this day and age where you don't get a whole lot of really great news and things like that, this this blows me away. And... Uh, for all the effort that you put in, Brent, I, I, I applaud you for for everything that you, you that yeah. you've done with this, and all the extra work to you know, have uh, uh, Mr. Patterson, you know, restore it. Let alone get mm -hmm. it out to to Jeff and his family. Uh, I, I I think that's just such such a wonderful thing that uh, you know. What better way to grow the game than to show this kind of thing? Because that's what lacrosse is all about. Is you know, that's out? kind of what it was. I, you know, once I found out that, that there was a possibility that the person who owned it or their family was still able to be reached, I, I wouldn't have felt right about keeping it anyway. Um, and I thought, you know, my father was an athlete, although he, he played baseball. And if somebody came to me now and said, hey, listen, we found your dad's old baseball glove, you know, from his collegiate days. Um uh, who wouldn't want that? You know, my, my, my original fear when I couldn't reach the, the, the individual whose stick it was, was, you know, maybe this guy got rid of that stick 40 years ago and it was like, kid, I got rid of that thing when I stopped playing lacrosse. What, what the heck are you calling me for? You know? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there was always that notion that, well, maybe, maybe it was sitting in a bin in a store somewhere because he, he got rid of it. But once, you know, we made contact and everything, I was like, listen, if, if somebody contacted me, with anything, right? Whether it was a piece of sporting gear or something from a military, my grandfather's World War II, whatever. Um, you know, that was always important in my family was things that, that were from the previous relatives and previous generations. So, you know, once I found out, I wouldn't have felt comfortable keeping it. And I was like, all right, we got to get this to where it belongs, which is um, if not the family directly, then, you know, I reached out to RPI to see if, you know, they could uh, find out whose it was and maybe they'd want it for a trophy case. Hey, this was one of your players from back in the day. So one way or the other, I wanted to find a home for it and it wasn't going to be me, but it was based on what you said. I, I, I wish people had more of an appreciation for the past of our sport. And I know that some do, but uh, you know, those sticks and, and things like that had, should have a reverence you know, attached to him that I don't see a hundred percent of the time. So I was kind of like, yeah, this dude, we got to, we got to get this stick to the, to the grandkids or the kids or the family, whatever. Um, Absolutely. It does, the thing yeah. of it's a fly swatter that we use now, you know, some of that, yeah. uh, some of that Tupperware, which is uh, machine manufactured and they put out a bazillion of them a day. And um, one that is uh, manufactured by hand 
Yeah. And like I say, the process is a year and a half. I know Alfie's process was about 10 months, but again, it wasn't uh, leather leather strong and everything. So um, from start it's to finish. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, and can you, it's, you, you mentioned Alfie a couple of times, but I, I don't know, Alfie, what, what's Alfie's last name? I don't know, I don't know. The, yeah, Alfie Jacks. Yeah. Okay. Alfie Jacks. Uh, he just passed away um, back um, about the beginning of the summer. Oh. Uh, he'd been battling cancer. Um, and him and his dad, for many years, were, were the guys. To get an Alfie Jack stick is still uh, one of the biggest things around. And, um, you know, Lax Night, which is just finished this weekend, uh, it used to be in Onondaga, where Alfie is from, mm -hmm. and uh, they would have a stick festival running concurrently with it, and he would have all of his equipment from his shop out there and showing how the sticks are made and how he bends them and, you know, go through the whole process. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite memories of, of, of Alfie is I was able to have dinner with him one night after he got all the stuff back to his shop, and uh, here we are at the Bull and Bear, you know, having, <laughs> having a burger or whatever, and he's just talking about, you know, just a process of cutting down the hickory tree it had to be, um, you know, near the root and it had to be because there's a part that was uh, too, too tough on that uh, tree that they couldn't bend it. They couldn't do anything with it and to find it, to cut it, to cord it. And every piece of that tree went to use, you know, the true native tradition, nothing goes to waste. So if they're not using it, the shavings go into the steaming and, and they use everything. And the process for that particular type of stick was about 10 months and he had many his mm. workshop was full of you know partially things that needed to get strong or needed to get this or whatever so it was a kenya thing and as he got older and a little bit uh, not not at 100 percent uh it, it was uh, to a couple of hundred a year that he would be able to make and uh you know i'm, I'm hoping well, i was just talking with uh, with dan boyer last night about it um because he was good friends with alfie as well and we're wondering who's going to uh, take over. I'm hoping it doesn't just go and, uh, you know, that's the end of that because that workshop was incredible to go over. Yeah, and, I don't yeah. think it will because I, I believe he had some apprentices. Mm -hmm. You know, Alf like trained, trained a lot of guys, more. and and he and he has a, a young kid that he mentored for 10 years. I, I'm pretty sure Ron, you know, studied at, at Alfie's side at right. one point. And, um you know, I mean, it's kind of to put it in context, if you have like a Leo Fender, Fender guitar that he made, mm -hmm. or you have a Les Paul, mm -hmm. you know, um, you're, you're never going to get a true Alfie stick again, but you'll have people that he passed on his his skill and and, and uh, his knowledge to. But, um, you know, with, with your dad's stick, that was one of the reasons why I was so stoked because I'm like, you know, listen, poor college kid that was an investment to buy that stick or to, you know what I mean? And, and um, I don't know, I just got it kind of got a nostalgic history kind of thing about the sticks and, um, and, you know, there's a reverence for them I wish we had. And so I was, I was happy that it turned out this way because I, I don't know, I wouldn't have felt right having that thing just sitting on my wall. If there was somebody that would have a better um part of their that stick would be a, a more pivotal part of their life than just something i picked up and now it gives me an excuse to go find more and get ron to get <laughs> more for me you know and now is, oh, I, is ron alfie's related to alfie is that uh not related but you know ron um you know was from a reservation about 35 40 miles uh um east of onondaga and he you know he i know that he studied with Alfie at some point earlier in his, in his career when he was learning how to make sticks and, and how to uh, repair them and things of that nature. Okay. Alfie was uh, a fountain of knowledge for, you know, 40 some odd years to guys that, you know, for, and not just, uh, not just wooden sticks. He made a lot of other, you know, things like snow snakes and, and things of that mm. nature. Like he was just, uh, if you wanted to learn, he, I mean, he had, he was my coach. So I knew him a little bit. Um, if you wanted to learn and you you wanted to learn the right way for the right reasons, he'd probably he'd probably mentor you a little bit. But it wasn't like something that he just did for anybody off the street. You know, it was a handful. That's about it. Yeah, and he was very. Well, I feel easy. so. Oh, sorry, very, Gary. Very easy to talk to. Uh, it's a little sarcastic at times. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, you always get a great answer out of him. That's for sure. He was funny. Yeah, he was a good guy. Well, I feel so grateful to uh, so many people along the way here. Um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to have to talk to my family about um, how we can give back in some way to the lacrosse fraternity or to um, the folks who, who created these amazing things in the beginning. Well, can I drop one thing, Gary? Cause I would be remiss if I didn't Ryan, who's not on Ryan Smith, who's not on the call. He was yeah, instrumental. He, was son. He, he left me a message. Yeah. He told me that he was coaching. Yeah, but he was instrumental because it's his Facebook page, and he's the one that I believe – I don't remember how, maybe from an obituary listing or something, but he found um, you to contact you about me. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention him because he was, he, was, he was integral in me, in me locating the home for the stick. You know what I mean? But you can see there's a reason why it's called the medicine game. Oh, yeah. yeah. So many ways because hmm. it's a healing yeah. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Just this, I mean, just this whole story alone, you know, you're talking family, you're talking community. We know the lacrosse community is a tight knit community. And um, I believe it was Alfie who, quote, you know, what a train quote from Alfie was, you know, every stick has a story. Mm hmm. So. Well, if you think about it now, I don't know how familiar you guys are with New York State, but where I was, okay, RPI is in Troy, New York, which is about, you know, across the river from Albany. And I'm 30 minutes north of that. And the store I bought it in is 30 minutes north of that. So I buy this thing, you know, halfway to Lake Placid, New York, and now it's in Vancouver. Okay, and it had all these it had all these stops in the way. It went to Syracuse for Ron to fix it, and then it came back to me. And and if you want to know the funniest story, I mailed the thing from Portland, Maine, which is where I was. <laughs> okay. So this thing has definitely been on a journey, and I have no idea where it went from 1961 to 2022. So um it still it, has some stories to tell. It probably it's amazing that it found it's found its way there, but it shows you. It found its way to you for a purpose and for a reason. And well, that, like course, I said, I, I'm family. glad that it. I'm glad that it worked out because, um, uh, you know, I, I I don't want it to sound over dramatic, but like when I was striking out, and I was like, well, you know, maybe, uh, and and you know, I didn't think so, but you know, I thought, okay, you know, 1961, the guy would be in his late 70s, early 80s. It's roughly my dad's age. I'll I'll track the guy down. He's still around, and. I was striking out when I went to that uh, that forum to say, hey, you know, I'm trying to locate the home for this stick. You guys were helpful uh, tracking down the name a couple months ago. Anybody got any ideas, let me know. Um, and then, you know, once we located the family, then it was almost like I was on pins and needles. Uh, and, I, and I understand the trepidation Jeff had because he's like, who the hell is this guy contacting me? You know what I mean? And once I found out, okay, we tracked down the right people. This is the right guy. Then it was like um, a butterfly in the stomach thing. I'm like, listen, I got to get this thing over there. I got to get this thing mm -hmm. to them. I got to get it in their hands, you know? And so when it finally panned out and I got the thing packed up, that was that was the other big lump in my throat. I'm like, I don't want this thing getting all beat to hell and shipping. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm trying to find the right box. I loaded that thing with peanuts. I bubble wrapped it. And I was still nervous when I handed it to the UPS guy. Um, that I was going to go through this whole thing, this journey was going to happen, and then somebody was going to heave it in the back of a UPS truck, and it was going to not, you know, get there in one piece. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful for how it all panned out, you know. Likewise. I, I think the story is absolutely amazing. And we're having it on, and then on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation weekend, how much more fitting can we have without talking oh, about Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever that and you know there's so many good stories and so many feel good things uh, about the game in itself and this is just just one that's just spectacular and uh brent had kept me up to speed all the way through the process and then of course we we reached out to jeff earlier and he hadn't gotten a stick yet so we we moved things a little bit uh, a little bit back so that it all worked out here where he had the stick in his hand so you now to me the timing is you know i'd like to say it's random but maybe not maybe not and I, I think that the whole thing is just spectacular. Jeff, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming on and showing off the stick. I want to thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us a little bit about your father and about uh, all, all the things that, uh, you know, the emotions and everything else that went in uh, receiving the stick. And, of course, Brent, yeah. I want to thank you for keeping me in the loop all the way through this. And, of course, Brent and I go back a ways, uh, you know, through his videos and through his playing career and a few other things in there. 
And, uh, you know, it's always great to talk to you, Brent. Well, I appreciate it. And, you know, I was more happy. I, I, again, I don't mean it to sound corny, but I hope that, you know, when people find these things, because that, that forum is showing ever since Alfie passed, there seems to be this, all of a sudden, this resurgence of guys wanting traditional sticks. And I'm like, well, okay, if you happen to find one, and there's there's markings, there's details on it. Don't don't be so in a rush to stick it on your mantle. You know what I mean? There might there might be somebody who that stick would mean a heck of a lot more to you or to them than it than it does to you. And I know that sounds a little hokey, but um, I, you know, I was so stoked that I could get this to, you know, somebody whose kids or grandkids could say, hey, that was you know that was my dad's and that you know whose stick that was. You know, you you might get that when you're 15. I might give that to you. That was, I, I hope that that happens a little bit more whether it's from this story or you know appreciating alfie or whatever you know absolutely Go ahead. um so ne next week i'm gonna uh, i'll be at a thanksgiving uh dinner with a bunch of uh family and extended family so i'm gonna bring the stick and uh cool. i'll try to get some uh pictures with it for you that'd be awesome thank you thank and you. that is the the continuance of it that's beautiful that's wonderful that's right. guys i want to thank awesome. you again Thank you so much for for uh, for sharing the story with us. Um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll be talking to you guys soon. <laughs> All right. Thank me, you very much. You. I'd love to. Thanks love so to. much for coming on, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks very yeah, much. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Brent. All right, you're welcome. All right, take care, guys. Take care. That was Brent Coy and uh, Jeff Doria. Uh, what a fantastic story, eh, Mike? Yeah, just phenomenal. Just uh, and and you know, I mean obviously you know it's it's it was it was tragic and sad you know alfie's passing but um you know uh i think one sort of good thing you know for lack of a better word to, to come of it i think is is the resurgence that that brent talked about and uh just knowing that um you know that he had apprentices that there are other guys like ron patterson out in oneida nation um and you know likely you know i'm sure there are there are there are stick makers and uh the other uh the other members of the uh the confederacy um you know continuing to to hone this this craft you know it's uh you know ma making sure that it doesn't get lost that that it continues Absolutely. and, and that, you know that it stays alive you know to, to honor the creator so much, to, about, so much about this game so much about this that uh isn't on the floor and we just saw a huge chunk of it and again how the lacrosse community comes together which is why i love this game so much you know absolutely the game itself is almost secondary to really the emotion and the feeling and the family patrick what's going on welcome and just to catch up on a couple of things there uh brian thank you very much for for sticking with us appreciate it I had this up before, but uh, Mike, you have a fan. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll let you know when the Muffler Mike fan clip we're gonna strolls through San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave. Dave, hey, you had Dave. a big day today, Dave. Beat up on the Patriots, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Bro. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, I tell you, it's just a... Uh, Wonderful. And Eduardo, of course, was talking about the, uh, you know, truth and reconciliation. Uh, important holiday needs more awareness is right. It needs more awareness. I don't know about the holiday part, but uh, I know uh, it needs a hell of a lot more than what has been given. And it needs to get pushed further, much further. Uh, things have to be done because my, my, my thought on that was if it was any other race, that there would be tribunals, there'd be all kinds of things going on. I don't understand why we keep tripping over ourselves and kind of, shh, it'll go away. This should be taken care of, and things should be put to where it should be. Anyways, let's move on. We had uh, we had a little bit of news this week. Um, the majority of things have already uh, come and gone, but uh, this was a big one. And this is a stepping stone, I think. Uh, the BCJAL have, uh, has announced Logan Shuss is the new GM of the Delta Islanders. Now, this is a stepping stone. Before you know it, he's going to be a GM of a WLA team. 
And before you know it, he's going to be a GM of a NLL team. Uh, I don't think that there's any uh, thing that's going to be stopping Logan. I think he's got the right mind set for it, and uh, it's only a matter of time. This is the first in a number of levels that he's going to be moving along as his career progresses. Just don't forget he's still playing. That's right. <laughs> Recently signed with Calgary, I believe. Absolutely. Absolutely, which brings us into our next foray of NLL signings, y'all. Um, not as many as before, obviously, but some big ones still. Austin Stotts, uh, he's got a two-year deal with the Seals. Um, I don't think it was ever in doubt, but, uh, you know, now it's there. This one was a little bit of a surprise, but, uh, you know, I don't think he fits into Toronto's plans anymore. Um, they're, they're kind of, you know, right heavy. And uh, Stephen Keogh has gone back to where it all began, uh, over to Rochester, and uh, he's got a one-year contract. Now, being a Hamilton firefighter, I guess going to Rochester or going to – it's just pretty much the same distance. <laughs> Kevin Orleman has signed one year with the Riptide. Uh, if you remember correctly, he came in there and he looked good and then got hurt. So he's all healthy and uh, raring to go and uh, – you know, just adds to the uh, to the mix of goaltending that they have over in New York. Panther City has given a multi-year contract to Nathan Grennan, and I think that's fantastic. Like I've said before, a product out of Brampton, I've seen him uh, grow up uh, and become the player that he is, and it's fantastic. Uh, he really emerged during that bubble two-week whirlathon that the uh, the OJLL put on just at the end of COVID. And um, he was first round drafted and he's just gone continuous from this point and to where he is now. And he gets better and better every game. And he is an integral part of Panther City and their rise. Yeah, fan favorite. And I think he lives in market. So that's a plus for yeah. for the market. So uh, Albany, uh, they, uh, they signed Andrew Kitt, which is another great little – Gift on to them. Uh, you know, the beaches, he had a great career there. And, uh, you know, he's going to do, well, a lot of learning behind Doug Jameson uh, before eventually he will uh, take the reins. Vancouver, of course, uh, as they do every week, make news. Uh, last week we were talking about uh, all the uh, exiting. Well, we're bringing people in. And this was only a matter of time, of course, in Calgary uh, with Miloski leaving and with Sanderson coming in and bringing in Phil Sanderson, and accordingly, uh, Bob McMahon was looking for a new home. And since uh, him and Miloski have had such a great working relationship in Calgary, it's only fitting that Bob McMahon is off to the offensive structure of Vancouver and working with Kurt Miloski again. And uh, stay tuned. I will have Kurt Miloski on the other show in a couple of weeks' time. So we'll be discussing all of the moves going into training camp. So it should be an exciting time. Uh, sticking with Vancouver, Chris Woolman has signed on. You know, we talked about he was part of the deal there, but uh, he signed on with Vancouver now, so now it's official. Tyson Kirkness, he is re-signed with uh, Vancouver. And uh, also Braden Leite is uh, signed with the Warriors. And, of course, they're pushing. They're pushing for crowd. They're pushing for everything else. Um, new faces, new team, new season. Uh, truer words could never be spoken. Because if you went to a game last year, you need to buy a program this year. Because ain't nothing the same. So, uh, I think that you guys are in, you know, starting at 180 bucks for season tickets. I think that's a bargain at twice the price. So, um, I think that uh, you should jump on this deal because you are going to be entertained beyond entertained. Uh, Eduardo agrees about Logan. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry to hear that, Dave. Sorry to hear that it wasn't a great day on the mound. But, uh, you know, Dallas winning has to be something. <laughs> Dave, you got to work on that Bugs Bunny pitch. That's it. I'll help you out. One, two, three, you're out. One, two, three, you're out. One, two, three, you're out. <laughs> Absolutely. 
I love that. I love that. Um, <laughs> Patrick, you're welcome. Uh, it's yeah. our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Uh-huh. Yeah, who's going to bring me into my next little thing? Um, Toronto is uh, their home opener is against Philadelphia, and uh, well, they're licking their chops over here, I think. But uh, I don't think I don't think it is like in years past where it's like okay, Philly's coming to town. The team that Philadelphia has uh, put together is enough to make anybody go, "Uh oh, that's, uh, yeah. that's yeah, not nothing, an easy." Yeah. No, nothing is going to be a gimme, this year <clears> not at all, with any team. So, but Toronto was busy again this week. Um, Chris Boucher, the trade that we talked about, he's now signed on for two years. So um, that's going to be a pretty dynamite front because they did a few more signings. Uh, the one that I, that's a friend of mine is Cam Milligan. Um, really great to see Cam land here in Toronto, being a Peterborough boy. And um, Curtis Woodland and Brian Rice, who is also a fantastic player. So this could be a very interesting <coughs> Excuse me. Very interesting camp. Yeah, yeah, I, I know for a fact Rice is he's come close to making the league a couple of times. I think he's uh, he's been in camps in Georgia and New England when uh, when the Firewolves were still the Black Wolves. Uh, yeah, yeah. Say Milligan, he's had a few a few homes. Yeah, but uh, you know a little bit closer here. Uh, he had a great summer with both Peterborough in MSL and with the uh, Oakville Rock in Ontario Series Lacrosse, as well as with the Prezies. And he had a great Prezzy as well. So obviously they saw something in his game that's going to really help out. He's a good sniper. Uh, he's a good leader on the floor as well. And, um, you know, being a younger guy uh, amidst all the veteran leadership there, he just has to worry about playing. And I think it's going to be fantastic uh, for the both, for the team and for him. Uh, we had a few more signings with the Rock. They signed all of their draft picks. Uh, the big one, of course, is Zach Kearney. Another one from the uh, Oakville Rock uh, this past uh, summer with the Ontario Series and the Prezi. He had a great showing there, too. He likes to be in the middle of it all. Uh, he's going to be – he's not the biggest kid, but uh, he doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. And uh, in my eyes, that's refreshing. Someone who's going to get inside uh, is an absolute star in my eyes. Chase Siobhan, uh, another um, another one that can drop the mitts if needed. Uh, a tough kid. Um, spent the last year in Orangeville, and uh, he's going to be a, a, a good one too. Uh, John Weller and uh, Brett Hanser are both uh, going to be uh, uh, vying for a job. I don't know if they want to be in the, uh, on the practice squad, but I'm pretty sure they're going to see game time this year if they're uh, still around here in Toronto. Uh, looking over to Calgary, Evan Soucy has been signed, and Bennett Smith also been signed. So Calgary is rounding out their stuff too. They're also going to have a really, really uh, interesting team. They're going to have a much more in-depth team, I think. What do you think, Mike? Uh, definitely more physical. Uh, yeah, just, really. just, uh, <laughs> just, um, just Thomas Hogarth alone, I think, is, is going to be. That's a big uh, one. That's yeah. a big one because you got yeah. that big body in front with great hands who can mop up all of those uh, rebounds. And uh, yeah. I mean, him, him, him on the right and Tanner Cook on the left. I just, I can't get over just the yeah, size and the physicality eh? that, that you're going to have on each side. With, with now you have a, you're talking about having a Jesse King firing shots as well. So you've got all kinds of things going on. There's going to be a lot of chaos in front of the nets. And oh, yeah. Yeah. that was the one thing that was missing in Calgary's game. And of course, if you, um, you know, actually get caught having Kristen Del Bianco in the back as always one that will, uh, you know, be very forgiving to the odd uh, offensive prowess that you're going to have now. So I think it's going to work very well. And I think uh, the Sanderson's are on to something here as well accordingly. Yep. Oh, Patrick. Oh, with Zach Higgins. <laughs> well, there's Deacon not, right? There's Deacon not. And as far as I know, Angus Goodleaf is still part of the roster. So, but uh, let's move on. Buffalo had a couple of signings. Their 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 training camp is going to be fifty, I think, by the time they're done. They just keep signing. 
Yeah. Dan Krakowski, he's on a one-year deal. And Brian Wiles, he's also on a one-year deal. I'm telling you, man, there has to be because the four goalies and all, the, the entire team has come back uh, from the championship, as they should. And uh, all these other signings they've had, I'd, I'd say 40 to 50 deep. It's going to be a absolute slobber knocker in yeah. training camp for positions. And only the strong will survive. Yeah, you know, uh, I believe that. I believe they only they've only lost two players. I think. Yep. So Ethan O'Connor signed with Rochester, and uh, Kozevnikov was traded. Yeah. I so, like, like I say, this is going to be a nutty cuckoo kind of thing. But we we looked at it last year, and when you put together those uh, those depth charts, um, teams were bringing in thirty five to forty guys in a training camp vying for positions with 35 of them being NLL caliber. If teams only brought 35, 30 of them, NLL caliber. It's the most amazing thing of the absolute depth that lacrosse has now with all the programs and more coming. And we were worried a bit about goaltending. Well, you have a whole heap of them who are going to be looking for work as well. Um. You know, I'm still not. Yeah, I mean, I, know, I, I, I would. Halifax, you know? I, I would venture to say, you know, I mean, I got, I got in, I got into the league around 2016. At the time, they had nine teams. Now they have 15. Uh, it's just as hard, in my eyes, to crack a lineup and a roster as it was six years ago, six seven years ago. Absolutely, I agree. When um, only 60 I, I think it might even be more teams. tough now because. You're looking, again, at all these programs and all these junior programs. The West has come. The U.S. has, has moved up. You know, Boxla, U.S. Boxla has, has done phenomenal work, you know, with guys like Dallas Elliott and some of the others in there doing the training and getting everything ready that we have this uh, bukun of players from all over the place. Now, an eye-opener for me, of course, was going to Prague, and I'll be going back again in April with some of these European players that nobody has paid any mind to because we're only talking about North American players. But just like hockey, these guys are going to be ready to come up to the NLL level as well. And these are, you know, from the grassroots onward, these are little, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds who are running around the arenas with their uniforms on, taking clinics from these guys. So as they grow up, that's going to be a viable option as well. And you take a look at that and, you know, when we first heard Sakeva say he wanted to bring it to 30 teams, I, as well as many others, were thinking, huh, that's going to water down that product something fierce. I am starting to go back on that thought. I don't think it will. By the time we get up to 30, uh, there's going to be so many programs going on that uh, we're going to be younger is what we're going to be. I don't think you're going to start seeing the 35, 37-year-old, 40-year-old who's looking to get those extra couple of games to make that record. I think it's going to be such a quick game. I think it's going to be a young man's game that by the time 30, 31 rolls around, really, if you're on, you are doing phenomenally. And you're one of the upper echelon players. Yeah. So just, just the way I see it. Anyways, um, a couple of things about the Premier Lacrosse from last week. Um, just a, a couple of little clips because, uh, of course, we know the Archers won. But um, one was uh, just – how hard that Graham Hossick hit was. And textbook, yes, but if he uh, if it was standing. He happened to do a little bit of jogging towards it, which is where the penalty came in. Other than that, the tip was clean, guys. It's it's actually textbook. That's yes. what I was thinking. It's a hit, though. And I'm asking because no clue. What's the, e what's the illegality of that hit, though? And I'm asking because no clue stick side like that. No. Oh, yeah, oh. You saw it coming. Shoots. Just that last clip, just in seeing it in context of the game, uh, I'd be talking to my teammate going, why did you set me up like that? Kaboom. It was like running into, it's like if you weren't looking as a kid and all of a sudden there was a telephone pole in front of you and poof, you hit it and it doesn't give. Hitting Hossick is like running into a telephone pole. He is not going to give. He is solid. So, now the other uh, clip I wanted to show was just how close it was 
to being the water dogs holding up that trophy. He should just shoot it. Trying to get it to McCardle. Clock is winding down. Caraway's gonna get a look. Oh, save made by Dobson. Point six left to go. Shot went off with two seconds left. That was the game. It was a two-point shot on a one-point lead. That was the game. Brett Dobson, the MVP. Yeah. Let alone the other 17 saves he made in that game. But uh, wow. Just wow. <laughs> Maybe we have to get Sean's fan club started. <laughs> I know he's out getting more tractors for uh, for Mike's. He went to different counties. Actually, Dave, he's, uh, he's celebrating his 10-year anniversary tonight, so we uh, we let him off so he can go and enjoy with uh, Mrs. Sled. We all are. We're all excited for the NLL season. It's uh, just around the corner. We're in October now. Training camps will be up in a couple of weeks' time, and preseason games start in the beginning of November, and first weekend of December is, of course, Face-off weekend for the NLL with lots of hoopla going on. Just a couple of commercials. Sherry's Ticket Town. This has been brought to you. All right, guys. It's time to talk about Sherry's Tickets. Sherry'sTickets.com is easy to use and has no hidden fees. The price you see is the price you pay. Pay less and play more with Sherry'sTickets.com. Save even more by using the exclusive promo code EOP10. That's EOP10. Do not pay hidden fees and save 10%. Why use any other ticket reseller and get those hard to come by tickets to the big game? If you need a more personal touch, give them a call at 610-494-5050. That's 610-494-5050. Sherry'sTickets.com also has great theater and concert tickets that are hard to get your hands on. Remember, do not overpay and save with the best at Sherry'sTickets.com. Save 10% using the promo code EOP10. That's EOP10. You'll thank us later. Sherry'sTickets.com. And uh, just, uh, Mike, uh, Sean is uh, listening, uh, enjoying his wedding anniversary. <laughs> and him and Dave should get on the phone because uh, for Sean, <laughs> you don't need us. We're just uh, in the middle here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lax Night, their yearly uh, tournament uh, was over and done. It was like a blur. But uh, this year, we had uh, USA White were the winners. Last year, if you remember the Rochester Bats and Mike Cooper, friend of the show, they uh, they were one. They were in there to try and, uh, uh, to try and uh, defend their championship. They came in fifth. Uh, they ran into a hot goalie. They went four and two, though. They had a good, good little uh, series there. Snake Island Muskies, if you remember them from Ontario Series Lacrosse and the President's Cup. Um, they finished second. The Seneca Marksman finished third. Frog Pond Maulers, fourth. Gold Star Tel Aviv finished sixth. USA Blue, seven. Grand River Ironmen finished eighth. The El Gods finished ninth. And Ari Green from Ireland finished in the top 10. Pretty incredible stuff. I was able to watch some because they put it on uh, through uh, the lacrosse channel. And uh, really some great lacrosse. A lot of big names on there. A lot of NLLers uh, in there. Up and coming NLLers as well as NLLers. And uh, just amazing lacrosse as always. Um, I, I really wish I could have gotten out there this weekend. But, um, you know, things are a little bit too busy. Plus, we had the women's sixes in Oshawa this, this past weekend, too. So things are things are roaring. Next week will be the men's sixes in Oshawa as well. Uh, just before we get on to the uh, the women's one, sorry, guys, I have to catch up on a couple of the commercials in here. This is for uh, Philly Sports Trips. All right, guys, if you're a Philly sports fan and you want to travel with your favorite team, then travel with the best. Go to phillysportstrips.com. They have self-travel packages and full travel packages available with round-trip flights from the Philadelphia airport. Packages include direct flights, four-night stays, all-inclusive tailgate parties, lower-level group tickets, 
Whatever you want, you got it with phillysportstrips.com. If you want to travel to an upcoming Phillies game, make sure you check out Philly Sports Trips. And do not forget, Philly Sports Trips has all the away trips for the Eagles' upcoming 2023 season. Jump on it now because you do not want to lose out on all these great opportunities. Go to phillysportstrips.com. That's right. And, uh, you know, the Eagles, they're one of uh, two teams, I believe, that started the season 4-0. and So, of course, even though it was a nail-biter today, a little overtime victory. Fly, Eagles, fly. Picking up where they left off last year. The women. This is uh, an interesting one. Box lacrosse and the women in the, uh, the last night tournament was just fantastic. The BP lawyers, which could have been substituted by calling them the Canadian national team uh, with, uh, you know, this new on there, uh, having uh, Erica Evans on there as well as a bunch of others. Uh, they wound up winning. The Salmon Belly is number two. The Haudenosaunee Nationals, this is the first time ever that they've had a team that has been sanctioned to play in one of these tournaments. And they finished number three. Another fantastic bit of news on this particular weekend. Awesome. Uh, WBLGN finished fourth. Team Israel finished fifth. Mavericks finished sixth. Tri-City finished seventh. And Team Airy, again, Ireland, finished in the top eight. And again, just amazing. You know, to see this kind of um, thing go through, it really is great to see women's lacrosse uh, being included number one. But to take it and run with it as they have with some fantastic lacrosse. Uh, they played Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and the men played Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think Thursday as well. Um, so they're catching up, and more and more teams are coming in. So this is fantastic news because remember when we had Michelle Boyer? Uh, if women's lacrosse catches fire like it should, we all win. There's just that much more great lacrosse to watch and that much more in the way of jobs for – People doing things that they just love. So to me, it's just a win-win. You know, support them. Support them. And uh, if you are traveling to some of these places and wind up in a bit of trouble. All right, guys, let's talk about Cherry Law Firm. If you get hurt at work in a motor vehicle accident, personal injury, or affected by criminal law, you got to call David R. Cherry of the Cherry Firm. Call 610 610- 565-0300 or go to cherryinjurylaw.com. Let David R. Cherry fight for your rights. Again, that number is 610-565-0300. That's 610-565-0300 or go to cherryinjurylaw.com. Let David R. Cherry fight for your right. You know, Mike, I was uh, I was looking and I've seen comments that, you know, the Rock, they don't like first-round picks. That's why they always trade them away and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's funny. Talking with the, with Jamie Dawick at the uh, at the NLL uh, Hall of Fame dinner as well as at the draft. And, you know, he brings up a really good point is that because of location, you know, Buffalo has the same advantage, Toronto, Rochester to an extent, Albany a little bit to an extent, not quite as much. But because of a lot of players – that live in the surrounding area. Um, you really don't need to worry about a first round pick because you can get somebody else's as a free agent. Hence Mark Matthews, as well as some of the others that have come through over the years. Um, having Chris Bushy here, is it going to be another really great first round pick from uh, elsewhere? So in that regard, it's not as important as a place like Georgia, a place like Saskatchewan, a place like even San Diego, which needs to keep its picks because there isn't these programs right there around the corner. The only other place really uh, in my eyes is in Vancouver, and they've had all kinds of trouble up until recent, and now they're starting to get their boys back. You know, Matt Beers, uh, Kevin Crowley, and all these guys who were all first-round picks uh, in their in their draft classes. And still young enough to make you know contributions, so again, it's about location. Unlike other sports, you know, it really matters in lacrosse. And 
most of these guys, because it's a part-time league, have their vocations here. So if they're working here, it makes it a whole lot easier uh, to get time off for an afternoon as opposed to having to take three days off so they can travel and then come back every week of the year. You know, I had uh, Austin Shanks on the other show on, uh, on Thursday. And, of course, um, he's uh, working with Toronto Fire. And uh, he had trouble in his first year, of course, not making some of the games because he was a rookie on probation and missing time is a no-no, not if you want to make that your career. So it had to come first. This year, of course, Jake Withers is in the same fire hall as he is. And, of course, Jake Withers is now, of course, rookie on probation. And so he's going to have some issues this year making all the games. And that's just part and parcel of being, uh, you know, in a part-time league. And luckily, uh, there's a number of first responders in the league, and they're able to reach out. I know that uh, that Austin had mentioned that he re reached out to the Dawson brothers a lot um, as he was going through everything and getting getting hired on how to do things and how to go about things. And, you know, you can't get better advice than from the Dawsons. Simple. And the lacrosse community, again, is a tight-knit group is able to help one another through this. And the league is very, very accommodating. So that's, that's the reasoning, is if you are in a remote area, you're more inclined to grab up all those first-round picks and, you know, build your team that way. Whereas a team like Toronto or Buffalo can go to the agent market, or Vancouver for that matter now, and build that way, and then supplementally take second-round picks and, you know, maybe find that diamond in rough in the third round and work that way. Just my two cents on it. No, it definitely makes sense. So it just, I think it'll take a little bit of the fire off of the, you know, I get tired of reading the comments because, you know, it's unfounded. You know, yeah. Get a clue and we'll talk. But, anyways, that's, uh, that's more or less it for this week, Mike. Um, there was uh, one signing last week, wasn't there? That we missed? Uh, probably. <laughs> There's been a lot of signings. <laughs> yeah, there has been. So. But yeah, stay tuned with us. Remember, you can catch us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Thread, YouTube. And games will be up next week. I just talked to the guy. Uh, I should have him at the, uh, the beginning of uh, this coming week. And I should have them up by Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, so there'll be a couple more NLL and MILL games on there to uh, to watch. Um, remember, you can catch interviews, fights, um, branding, everything out on our YouTube page. Uh, it's another tool for us to get as much content to you as we humanly can, as well as our Facebook page, as well as eopsports.com slash lacrosse, as well as Twitter and Instagram. So just another tool. So please let people know that it's there at all across all the time. While you're there, please subscribe to it. And uh, we're going to be able to do a whole lot more for you in the future. Uh, it's exciting. We're, we're really moving forward with things. And uh, this year's uh, NLL thing is going to be groundbreaking. I know I'm going to be doing quite a bit of traveling through this NLL season uh, as well. Uh, I believe I have a, a Vegas slash San Diego back-to-back -back, uh, coming to me in March as well, uh, just working out all the uh, little things um, in travel. But, uh, yep, that's a, that's a coming too, so that is in the works, as well as all the usual Buffalo, Rochester, Albany stops. And I know Mike is going to uh, uh, make it out to a, a New York game this year. Yeah, one or two. Maybe one more. or two. <laughs> Maybe even get him to an Albany game. Probably yeah. Albany as well, so. Yeah. And Sean, of course, is going to be at all the Rush home games. And uh, we'll see. Maybe Sean makes a trip to uh, to Calgary or Vancouver as well. But uh, we'll see how all that all plays out. But we will be able to cover everything for you. And, of course, Eduardo is planning on heading over to Vancouver to watch his uh, beloved Warriors, as well as, of course, uh, going to Panther City. Thank you very much. Take care. Great to have you, Brian. And uh, tight 
to just to touch on the, uh, the, the content that you mentioned, um, we are going to be starting up this week with our team outlook articles. So stay tuned every Tuesday and Thursday, uh, check us out on the edge of Philly sports website on all across all the time. Um, and there's confirmation. Sean will hope, hope to make a Calgary game. That's awesome. That's awesome. We have, we have your bases covered. Remember we have our finger on the pulse of the situation and come back to us three, four, five times a day on Facebook, on EOP, on Twitter and on Instagram. And we will have uh, up to date news for you uh, continually. Uh, Cause remember on these sites, we have news interviews, reviews, recaps, you name it, we got it. And our team is second to none. And we are more than happy to serve. And I believe we'll have a special guest on every Sunday this month. Yes. So. Yes. Next week uh, we have Johnny Meridian. Uh, he is going to be talking about some, some Philly stuff and some old Toronto stuff from way back. Uh, of course, being uh Part and parcel with the league. He was also part of the uh, the Buffalo uh, heyday in the 90s. So we have lots of story. And Johnny's fantastic. Great storyteller and can't wait to get him on the show. And the week after that, of course, we have Curtis Conley. Well, we have Curtis Conley of the New York Riptide. Yeah. And then the week following, I believe, we have Colton Watkinson of the Albany Firewolves scheduled. So Awesome. And, it's going to uh, be a fantastic month. And that will lead us right into – Training camps, training camps, and then all the fun begins. So stay with us um, continually because uh, we're going to have everything for you. We're going to be the cutting edge thing. This is going to be your source. Any final words, Mike? I'm just uh, – uh, <laughs> I got an Outlook article to write this week, so <laughs> absolutely, that's my big assignment, and I got to get working on those depth charts. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, me personally, I just want to thank I want to thank Mike. I want to thank Sean for all their hard work as always. I want to thank Eduardo. And I also want to thank Pat for their hard work as well. Uh, I want to thank Brent Coy, and I want to thank Jeff Doria for coming on the show and just absolutely warming our hearts with this story about this uh, this found stick and the refurbished stick and getting it to the family because uh, of all the times that we can uh, talk about things that aren't great. To have these these kind of stories are just spectacular and just put a glow on for me. And uh, I, I love it. And, uh, you know, I love hearing these things. So uh, if you have something of this, um, reach out, message me. I, uh, I'm i always uh, interested in listening to about, you know, great, great stories like this. Anyways, until next week, I want to thank you all again, week in, week out, for being with us and following along with us and following everything during the week. Um, we we can't thank you enough. And uh, again, next Sunday at 9 p.m., we're here for you at All Across Live. Until next week, be well, keep your stick in your hands.